Uh, this is Robert Schwartz, the author of Tools for Transforming Trauma. He's worked with trauma for 25 years and worked with energy psychology since 1996. He's the executive director of the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology. I'm Bob Schwartz, and I am here to talk to you about uh, a energy psychology as a brief therapy paradigm for uh, treating trauma. Now, I, like many of you, I've, I've had a few run-ins uh, with trauma, and I'm keen, keen, keenly aware of the power of brief moments in time to change history. For instance, I was 15, I was walking down the street uh, late at night, and a car comes screaming around, almost hits me, so I do what any red-blooded American young man would do, you know. Get, at which point the car comes to a screeching halt, guy comes out with a crowbar, and starts to run at me, and I just am so stunned, I don't even move. And he goes to hit me, and luckily I start moving, and the only thing he hits is my jacket blowing in the breeze, but if I had waited one or two more seconds, I wouldn't, I'd be in a wheelchair probably uh, talking to you, maybe I'd be talking to you. At 18, uh, uh, a few weeks after the Yom Kippur War, uh, myself and seven other Americans, uh, kids, were uh, walking and doing this hike through a, a tunnel that brought, that for centuries has brought water into the old city of Jerusalem, and we get attacked by uh, Palestinian adolescents. And again, by the hair of my chinny chin chin, uh, nothing significant happens, although it could have gone very differently. It would have, would have been an international uh, incident. Uh, in grad school, um, I used to have tremendous stage fright uh, until I volunteered for a demonstration subject uh, for a hypnosis seminar, and I, where I discovered uh, you, can, you can solve problems in a single session, uh, and here I am today. So as a psychologist, I have been uh, you know, really on a search for better and more meaningful ways to uh, work with clients and to especially to transform the negative impact of trauma. You've already, uh, already mentioned I've, I've written a couple of books. Uh, on treating trauma. I've been trained in psychodynamic approaches, family therapy, Ericksonian approaches, NLP that Steve was talking about, EMDR, and in 1996 I stumbled onto this uh, thing, this energy psychology called thought field therapy at the time. And uh, it's almost you know, 20, 20 years later and now I'm the, the director of the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology. Now, can I get my uh, volunteers to come up here? And uh, you might be wondering, energy? How many people even know about energy psychology? Just raise your hand, a few of you. So why are we talking about energy? And the answer is because we're bioelectric beings. So if you guys could just uh, give a circle. I'm going to show you what's going on here. I've got a little ball, and uh, I've got, there's two, uh, two points of contact. There's no batteries on the ball. If you could hold uh, one, push, she's going to put one. We're going to hold hand and watch. No, oh, we're both touching it. There you go. I can't touch you at the same time. Now, can you guys see? There you go, let go. You, you, you hold on. Okay. See, we are bioelectric beings. We're creating the electricity. Thank you very much. Very good. Simple demonstration. So what is energy psychology anyway? So it's energy psychology is a family of focused and brief uh, approaches to releasing stuck energy in the mind-body system, usually as the result of either big T or small t traumas. How brief? Well, we, you can, we can get rid of a trauma, a small trauma in five minutes. Larger traumas take 30, 40, 50 minutes maybe. Significant traumas. You didn't hear Ms. Hermia. We're talking about measuring, getting rid of traumas in 30 or 40 or 50 minutes. So that's pretty interesting. How, just how, how amazing is that? So let me show you a little bit more about that. In 1994, mm -hmm. The Rwandan genocide uh, killed a million people and left, left about a million uh, orphans. And in 2006, a, a team of therapists from the Thought Field Therapy Association went to the Shaddai Orphanage and treated 50 orphans who had uh, PTSD 12 years later. Now, if you were going to be working with people who had witnessed genocide, how many sessions would you get? Six? Would you give six, 10, 12? They used one session a single session of thought field therapy. And thought field therapy, what it is, is the client focuses on the problem and they tap on specific acupuncture points like I'm doing these right now. This is the thought field therapy algorithm for trauma. So what exactly changes? So after one session, 
what they found was, uh, from the caregiver's point of view, uh, when they rated them, 100% of the kids started off with PTSD. It went down to 6%. And from the kids' point of view, 72% rated themselves as having PTSD, went down to 18%. This is um, highly significant when they, when they measured this. And clinically, uh, there were dramatic reductions in flashbacks, nightmares, depression, isolation, jumpiness, difficulty concentration, and so on. And there were reductions held at one year, at one year follow-up. So I want to just give you a little bit more about one of the kids so you get a better felt sense. She was three years old when she witnessed her father uh, murdered by machete at a church. And this, these are the words of Carolyn Sakai, the, the person working with her. In her treatment, I asked her to bring the flashbacks to mind and to imitate me as I tapped on a selected set of acupuncture points while she told the story of the flashbacks. After a few minutes, her heart-wrenching sobbing and depressed affect suddenly transformed into smiles. When I asked her what happened, she reported having accessed fond memories for the first time. She could remember her father and family playing together. She said that until then, she had no memories from before the genocide. We might have stopped there, but instead I directed her back to what happened in the church. The girl started crying again. She told of seeing other people being killed. She reflected that she was alive because of her father's quick thinking and distracting the men's attention while telling the kids to run. And all the time, she's tapping along. Um, the girl cried when she re-experienced the horror she witnessed while hiding out, outside with, with another young child. And these two children were the only two children left alive from their entire village. After about 15 or 20 minutes of addressing one scene after another, the girl smiled and began to talk about her family and very early childhood events. She was laughing wholeheartedly as she relayed this, and the translator and I were laughing with her. We, went, we then went on to work through a number of additional scenes. And uh, finally, she, when asked, now when you think about what happened in the church, what comes up for you? And with no tears and you know, completely calm, relaxed affect, uh, she says, I can still remember it, but now it seems like a distant memory like 12 years ago. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear stories like this, and I see this kind of clinical outcome, and there's data to back it up, my reaction is, I want me some of that. <laughs> and I can tell you from personal experience that these kinds of rapid resolutions of trauma happen all the time. And I can also tell you that as commonplace as they are in my office, and, and in my practice, and in fact, I, I did a, a demonstration on, on Thursday. It was a very amazing uh, wartime trauma, hadn't been dealt with in 40 years, vanished. The bottom line is I'm still in awe, almost on, on a regular basis, that this stuff actually can happen. Now, Another reason I am really passionate about these approaches is that there is such a need for a quantum improvement in the way we treat trauma and PTSD in this country, especially for young men and women in the armed services. You know, the estimates are there are between 20 and 30 percent of soldiers that participate in the Iraq and Afghanistan war have PTSD. The suicide rate of veterans is at epidemic proportions. And it's, it's a nightmare, really. And they're not getting the treatment they need. Now, some time ago, I watched the 60-minute uh, show about a new treatment in the VA. Maybe some of you saw it. Unfortunately, they were talking about prolonged exposure, which is hardly new, where they forced soldiers to just tell the story over and over again. Uh, and frankly, not only is this approach barbaric, because it, it's emotionally very painful, it doesn't jive well with the current uh, knowledge of the neuroscience of trauma treatment. And most importantly, it doesn't even work all that well. The research protocol shows that uh, it, it's 12 90-minute sessions of prolonged exposure, and the success rate's only 49%. Now, if you compare that with EFT as an emotional freedom technique, which is the most common form of energy psychology, uh, there was a study done with, 40, with 49 people. There were six sessions, six-hour sessions. They had an 86% improvement rate. So basically, with this preliminary data, we see EFT being twice as effective in half the time. In other words, it's four times more powerful and more gentle than the, than the VA's favorite treatment. So my question is, why isn't the VA, you know, 
moving on this? Why aren't they using energy psychology? And frankly, I have no idea. I'm sure there's politics involved. The excuse is we need more research. But frankly, given this kind of data, the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense really should be funding a study for the benefit of young American men and women who deserve the absolute best treatment. They do spend a ton of money on all kinds of other stuff that doesn't show anywhere near the promise of these kinds of approaches. And frankly, if EFT doesn't measure up, I'll be glad to shut up. But that's not what's going to happen. The research findings are just outrageous. There have been over 50 published studies in peer-reviewed journals, and at least 96% of them have highly statistically significant findings. The other two are just weird, and I, I, they're even sort of positive anyway. But they're a little strange, so we can rule them out, leave them off. 20%, 20 of these studies are randomized controlled trials. And here's the thing, even as these studies' methodologies have gotten stronger and they've become more stringent, the positive findings have not diminished one iota. For instance, nowadays it's not enough to do statistical significance. You need to do clinical effect size. That's the real measure. And of the seven newer studies that measured clinical effect size, seven, all seven of them, 100%, had large effect sizes, which is, they come in small, medium, and large. So they all had large. Of the nine studies that had follow-up, 100% had sustained improvement at anywhere from three months to two years. So you can probably see why I'm kind of excited about this stuff. So what do these things look like? How does the protocol, how does the protocol go? So first and foremost, you're going to create rapport with clients. You're going to train the client in the procedure. You're going to establish appropriate expectations. You know, you're going to do good therapy. And then what happens is the client identifies a specific target, right? And then they rate it how much it bothers them to give it a SUDS, you know, subjective units of distress. And then the client focuses non-judgmental awareness on the target and activates various energy points with or without cognitive reframes. So these are, these, these are the energy points, right? There are different ones. And so this is where you also will maybe, if you've seen a video, you'll see somebody tapping the side of their hand, there's an energy point here, and they'll say, even though I blank, and that's the target, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Something, and then they go and they continue to focus on the target and they tap a variety of points. They go through a round, And once they go through that round, uh, you then reassess the suds and, if any, and anything else that comes up. And the rule basically is that if the suds is not zero and or if there is new data, you go back up to A and you repeat the procedure as, you know, until, until it's down to zero or near zero. Now, this is an exposure treatment with a, within a mindful frame while activating energy points or purported energy points of the body, of the, of the body. The entire trauma complex is, is systematically deconstructed, restoring more and more healthy flow of information and energy and more and more connection to the resources, to resourceful states of mind. And as I said, you can do this in, in many cases in a matter of minutes and certainly uh, within a therapy hour. How is this possible? Well, buckle up. Here we go. Our friend Dan Siegel has told us that we do psychotherapy, and that there is the therapy of the psyche and the mind. The mind is embodied. It's interpersonal between us. And what does the mind do? The mind controls. When I heard these words a few years ago when he was here, it blew my mind. The mind regulates the flow of information and energy over time. That's what the mind does. Wow. And the re when the flow is healthy, you have a healthy mind, you have a, health, you have a healthy emotional person. When there is a disruption in the flow of energy, problems develop. Sometimes you feel like you're not, sometimes you don't. And this is what we've been saying in energy psychology even before we knew about Dan's work. Emotional problems are caused by disruptions or blocks in the flow of energy in the mind-body system. Now the other thing that we say in, in energy psychology, in, it's a little bit of a, a change of uh, point of view, is that traumatic events are not the real source of the problem. The real source of the problem is the energy disruption in the system. Things that we call traumatic events are simply the kinds of things that are, are highly likely to, to cause energy disruptions in the system. And you can kind of, I've, I've made a little formula here that I don't have time to go into, but ask me later and I'll, I'll explain it. 
And here's the thing that's interesting. Anything, any therapy that restores the healthy flow of information and energy is therapeutic. But the cool thing about energy psychology is, is it's the only group of therapeutic approaches that explicitly, explicitly uses the energetic systems of the body, which is one of the reasons why it's so helpful. So, how does it do that? Well, let's look at how trauma problems develop. Number one, a small T or a large T event occurs, which then disrupts the energy, which then leads to affect dysregulation. And when that happens, then the cl that activates defenses, which causes more energy disruption, which then uh, forces uh, the flow of energy and information in the mind to become more chaotic or more rigid. You then have decreased access to resources. And then the client makes less resourceful behavioral choices, lifestyle choices, and, and self-narratives, which eventually leaves the person more um, uh, uh, prone, more vulnerable to further uh, small T traumas and large T traumas. When you um, treat the trauma, when you treat the energy disruptions, what happens when you, what, through this tapping? Affect regulates, the defenses soften, the flow of energy and information becomes less chaotic and less rigid. You get the event causes, uh, no, is no longer ups upsetting, and you, the person can make more resourceful behavioral choices, lifestyle choices, and has, and has a much better, more resourceful sense of self, which leads to resilience. Well, how does this happen? I mean, really? How can, how can this tapping thing do that? And let's, let me talk about this very briefly from a neuroscience perspective. There are a number of mechanisms that we think are going on. First of all, there's been a Harvard study that shows that when you stimulate meridian points, what happens is it, it downregulates the amygdala, so there's less of an alarm reaction. So one of the mechanisms is the decreasing of the amygdala alarm reaction. Another mechanism, there's been a study that shows that even one session of EFT lowers cortisol levels. So we're talking uh, behavioral, you know, we're not talking behavioral stuff, we're talking actual body-based things. There's other uh, studies that suggest that energy psychology downregulates vagal activity a la polyvagal theory, so the person has more uh, affect regulation. And the bottom line is there's this very deep sense uh, of, the, the, of I'm in danger, that sense of I'm in danger is turned off. And if you've ever had energy psychology treatment, you, you know that the upwelling sense of danger, anxiety, bad, yuck, it just vanishes. There's not about words, it's not about understanding. However, once those danger signals are turned off, spontaneous insights, spontaneous cognitive shifts occur. And what you get is what Bruce Ecker calls, it activates therapeutic memory reconsolidation. In other words, the traumatic incident that drives the system unconsciously is permanently altered, so there's no more driver. So EP appears to work simultaneously on multiple bodily influences. Now, lest you think, I've got two minutes, I can take a drink. So I'm at the end. Lest you think that I am advocating uh, for a technique-driven only therapy, really nothing could be further from the truth. It's actually a very deeply, deeply mindful approach, both for the therapist and for the client. You know, everyone focuses on the tapping part. And event, I think the research is, go is going to show, it's, there's some that's starting to show, that this tapping part, this activation of the, of the energy system, is an important part of the treatment. But that's the rote part. You, a monkey could do it. A computer could do that part. It is the attunement of the therapist to the process of the client that lets you pick and choose where to tap, what to focus on. That is a, a deeply personal experience that goes on between the client and the therapist, and that's a matter of craft, and that's a matter of art. One of the great strengths of EP is that it allows the clinician to stand in the face of significant to horrendous trauma in a completely present manner. One of the things that we often do, it, it sort of has grown up, that when, you're, when the client's tapping, oftentimes the therapist is tapping along with. So we're treating ourselves as you're listening, so your, our systems are staying down-regulated. So we're allowed, we get to stay fully present with client, and we have this, there's this expectation that by using these uh, procedures with our clients, the eventual result within that session is that the client has much more emotional freedom and healthy restoration of, of 
information and energy flow is restored and the client feels a lot better. Thanks very much.